all. So welcome everybody to this research season 2022 event on integrating intersectionality, where I'm joined by four incredibly dynamic writers and scholars, Sajada Subramanian based in Ohio State University, Sarah Ellen Ford in Bowling Green State University, Vijayta Kumar in St. Joseph's College Bangalore, and uh, Radhika Gajla also in Bowling Green State University. I'm Moitri Basu, senior lecturer here at LCC in the communications and media department. And I've been in conversation with these scholars over various texts through emails, video calls as collaborators, as edited, editor, as edited. But today I wanted to bring them together to converse with me about their thoughts on intersectionality on digital media and the affects and complications of participating in feminist dialogues in hashtag mediated spaces like Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. As a starting point, I've taken their recently published book chapter in the edited collection Networked Feminisms um, by Lexington Books. Um, the chapter is called Online Indian South Asian Digital Protest Publics Negotiating Hashtag POC, Hashtag BIPOC, um, and Anti-Caste. As a scholar researching affects and spaces of social movements and change, I'm perhaps unhealthily attracted to the notion of flat affects, affects that don't register clearly or at all and little or no measurable change. I'm moreover extremely suspicious of what this claim of researching these spaces might do or bring within these short-lived ephemeral and episodic discourses. Am I in these spaces a lot to build myself up as a researcher, activist, diasporic feminist, um, woman, woman of color, et cetera, et cetera. So I have and embody these identities pragmatically, uh, but I don't take them seriously enough to commit to any of them. Um, still, we have to acknowledge that bodies have or lack privilege, names do as well, as do academic titles and institutional positions. Invoking privilege and legitimacy takes many forms and is often implicit, some of which will be spoken by myself today and also my fellow interlocutors. Um, as an organizer, I have the privilege to moderate, of course, and timekeep. Um, I also wrote the, uh, the title and abstract. Um, and this online meeting format, of course, imposes another sort of dynamic of risk and privilege, as well as a flattening of our identities and positionalities as co-speakers, and unfortunately to all of you as audiences. But to counter this to a certain extent, I'll invite each of my co-speakers um, to please introduce themselves to the audience in their own terms, rather than me introducing them, um, in the order of increasing academic institutional seniority. Um, although focusing on the published chapter by uh, Sajatha, Sarah, Vijayta, and Radhika, as well as drawing on our past conversations, imposes a kind of continuity to the discussion today. I've also asked each speaker to feel free to air new ideas, diverge from the abstract if they wish to, as well as take on new positions in relation to the text of the chapter and the abstract. We will speak in that order. So uh, Sajatha, Sara, Vijayta, Radhika, and then I as a respondent will speak last before engaging each other in a discussion based on our provocations for 10 minutes. We will then open up the discussion to audience questions and comments um, so please use the Q&A box to send us your questions. You can do that throughout the talk. You don't have to wait till the end. And I'll read them out once uh, we're ready to receive questions. Thank you very much. And I ca call upon Sajatha to please start. Um, hello, everyone. I am Sujata Subramanian, and I am a PhD candidate in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the Ohio State University. Um, I'm also a member of the Detention Solidarity Network, which is an online space um, that aims to bring together conversations around carcerality in India. Um, so with regard to the chapter that all of us co-authored and which is um, going to be the focus of uh, discussion today, um, I just want to introduce uh, how I came to be part of the chapter and what my interest in co-authoring with all of my brilliant co-authors was. Um, so like I mentioned, I am a PhD candidate um, in a North American university um, who studies feminism. And in some senses, um, I find myself to be an interloper 
in the North American academy um, in many ways, but especially because of my identity as someone who comes from an oppressed caste community. Um, and it is uh, conversations around um, caste uh, that I had with Dr. Gajala that um, got me uh, uh, that uh, got me interested in co-authoring with her um, and with Vijeta and Sarah because um, one of her concerns in this chapter is to look at the way in which caste is either erased um, or flattened in the knowledges produced as part of the North American Academy. Um, and I think um, my interest also lies in someone who is trying to navigate these spaces, like I said, as someone who's not from an upper caste community. Um, so I think especially uh, as someone who's on the job market right now, um, I find myself thinking a lot about uh, initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, I also uh, think about these questions as someone who mentors um, students from other oppressed caste communities. I'm a mentor as part of, a, in, of an initiative called um, Equity in Policy Education, uh, which aims to increase the presence of oppressed caste students uh, in institutions of policy education. Um, so I think um, more than kind of discussing, um, you know, <laughs> talking about these concepts, I think I want to raise a few questions around how caste is taken up especially in um, both the Global South and Global North academia. Um, so my training, my graduate training has partly been in the North American University, but I also uh, have a graduate degree in women's studies from um, an Indian university, from a leading social sciences Indian university. Um, and what I found there was that even though I was being prepared uh, for a graduate education in women's studies, and I was being introduced to theorists like Judith Butler or Michelle Foucault, um, I did not read Dr. Ambedkar or Savitri Waifule as part of my um, graduate education in women's studies. Um, this, despite the fact that someone like Dr. Ambedkar um, or the Fules are the anti-caste leaders who struggles made it possible for someone like me, uh, who's an oppressed caste woman, to enter the university in the first place. Um, what I found what I was left with was, you know, the was in excluding these voices, what was the university telling me about whose lives um, and whose ideas matter, right? Um, and uh, even to this day, what we see is that, you know, not only do education, exclude and dehumanize those who are not upper caste Hindus, um, but also that in the rare instances, uh, oppressed caste people find their way, oppressed caste people or Adivasis, and, and um, in the contemporary uh, situation, even Muslims find their way in universities, um, they always figure as victims. Uh, they never figure as theorists. And, and here I'd like to draw on uh, what Dr. Gopal Guru talks about um, in terms of social sciences in academia, where Brahmins are given the privilege of being theorists um, and knowledge producers, whereas Shudras are present only as empirical evidence, right? Um, their their uh, presence in academia is reduced to giving evidence of violence, but never being theorists of their experiences or theorists of um, social structures. Um, and I would also like to invite my colleagues present here, uh, many of whom are uh, you know, uh, located in the Global North universities uh, to think about who they are in solidarity with, um, even when they uh, attempt to build solidarities across borders. Um, and why is it that the majority of South Asian faculty, both in Indian universities and universities outside India, um, why, why do they continue to be from dominant caste communities? And, and when faculty in these universities do include voices from South Asia in courses on post-colonialism, for instance, um, do they actually interrogate who they're including? Uh, and do they interrogate whether at all they're attentive to how histories of colonization, for instance, interact with systems of caste? Um, do my colleagues in academia question the ways in which initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion present in these universities fail to recognize how systems of caste and religion shape our access to learning? And I would like to ask if, it's, if it is enough for us to undertake cross-border alliances without asking ourselves these questions and without being attentive to the multiple systems of power that operate even within 
um, transnational attempts at solidarity or even transnational uh, bodies of knowledge that we build. Um, so these are some of the questions that we've taken up in our chapter. And like I said, I am personally invested um, in these questions as someone who is navigating multiple systems of power. Um, but I'd also maybe um, like to think further about how, um, how, I, how I can go beyond uh, these questions just as they affect me and how I can maybe think more broadly about um, questions of knowledge building. Um, and I think I look forward to the conversation with my colleagues um, in the, in, as part of the event. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the article or the chapter, I should say, that we put together. So my name is Sarah Ford. I'm an American Cultural Studies doctoral candidate at Bowling Green State University, where I primarily focus on digital fan communities. I was brought into this project by uh, Dr. Gajala. So when looking at spaces like a digital fan community and looking at the way non-white fans were treated in these communities, uh, Rukmini Pandey discusses the experience of Sri Lankan fantasy and sci-fi author uh, Vajar Chandrasekhara, who found himself suddenly labeled by the American markets as an author of color without his say. Both Pandey and Chandrasekhara view this use of the term person of color as a pure statement of American cultural hegemony because the term is used as part of a US centric language that carries its own specific history of marginalization that essentially flattens the realities of the people it claims to identify. And I use this point to explain how the placement in which a person enters a digital space can shift their identity in that space. And it's not that their perception of themselves immediately changes when they're given a label such as this, but that if you have other people in this space putting that label on them, it can shape how others view them and then possibly reflect back on themselves. For example, our research focused on the uh, do-it-yourself fiber crafting communities online. These are spaces that are largely based in the global north and dominated by global north voices. Uh, this is reflected not only in the actual makeup of who is in these communities, but how those spaces perpetuate a neoliberal sense of entrepreneurship where there's no longer uh, enough just to enjoy a hobby, such as weaving, knitting, sewing, et cetera, but that one should be turning this skill into a commodified income. Uh, by using data analytics to scrape hashtags such as diverse knitty and uh, BIPOC knitters on Twitter and Instagram, we were introduced to non-white voices in those fiber crafting communities who were actively discussing their placement in these predominantly white spaces. The hashtags allowed people to self-identify in a space where their whiteness had essentially been presumed unless they had previously addressed it. For some, the hashtag allowed for discussion of how racism and discrimination impacted their time in fiber crafting communities. But for others, primarily white users, the very act of being forced to acknowledge both the presence and experience of people of color in their space was seen as politicizing what they believe should be a non-political space, when of course the very fact that people of color had experienced such treatment in these spaces tells you it was not apolitical and that it had replicated Western discrimination. So the very act of identifying as non-white is seen as an act of activism by white users. Uh, this was done with the uh, use of umbrella hashtags such as uh, BIPOC knitters, which does not speak to any sort of specific identity other than non-white. So while the hashtag allowed for communication and the sharing of experience, the use of such self-identifying online often carries with it the burden of a sharing of experience and the burden of education. A person who enters into these spaces outside of a Western, specifically a US context, may find that their lived experience, be that based in gender, ethnic identity, sexuality, et cetera, is either flattened to be more palatable to their potential allies, or that they may find themselves placed into a position where they have to explain or even justify their personhood. And in particular, when you're looking at something that doesn't have a Western or a US correlation, specifically something like caste, the burden falls to marginalized folks to serve as educators in the space that they enter into for pleasure. Some can see this as a welcome opportunity to better the space for those who comes after them, while others 
can resent being forced into an activist position they did not want to claim. However, uh, for those who take the opportunity to educate, in quotes, their fellow users, it can create that connection between themselves and other marginalized users who see familiarity in their experience, bringing a stronger term to something like the hashtag VIPOC knitters. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Am I uh, sorry? Am I to go next? Yeah, sorry. I uh, yes. am audibly. Uh, my name is Vijita. I teach at Saint Joseph's College, Bangalore, India. Um, I was invited to uh, collaborate uh, uh, on this paper by uh, Professor Radhika. Uh, like, um, and uh, in the beginning, I was very uh, apprehensive because I'm not particularly, I'm not very fond of writing academic papers. Um, and I, I didn't really have much to say about uh, what intersectionality meant to me or what, what was happening on Twitter. Um, but I realized that I did have one thing to say, which I had noticed long ago, uh, which I found particularly disturbing because it meant that I didn't have to think. Um, and what was happening on Twitter was when uh, the, the generation of uh, Dalit women, uh, my generation of Dalit women were visible on Twitter. We were visible in a particular way, uh, which meant that uh, we were angry or we had to be angry to be visible. Uh, and that sort of got me thinking, and I'm not saying that all the other Dalit women from my generation were particularly or equally angry, but it seemed vocalized being Dalit on Twitter was to show anger or was to uh, display this kind of anger. Uh, and not that there is anything wrong with that, because I realized that um, we, when we reached out to each other on Twitter, it was because we were both, we were all sort of thinking through the things that have happened in our past and it seemed like we had arrived at a language finally to to figure out why it is that we're so angry uh, and when we found it because i think when we are all alone in workplaces or in schools or universities especially it becomes very difficult sometimes to to think through what is happening around us uh, whether these are um, systemic kind of attacks against your personhood in a workplace, in a Brahmin Savarna workplace, um, you sort of also want to wonder if you are doing anything wrong, uh, but you don't really have the language in which to, uh, in which to sort of articulate your own misery or your own anger. And then on Twitter, there was this community of solidarity that was being formed between sisters who had gone through the same thing and had felt the same thing and with was sort of vocalizing a certain kind of language that made it possible for me to, for me and several others to, to believe for a moment finally that maybe I'm not imagining this and uh, what happened to me was not right and this is what happened and I now I finally have a have a language. So that that was the beginning of this journey really into into understanding uh, how Dalit women were sort of coming together on. Uh, but I soon noticed that it, it, it sort of, it did good in that it did good in that we found voices and we found support and we found a way to, we found language most, most importantly. Uh, but then I realized that the only way you could maintain this kind of visibility on Twitter was to manufacture rage every day. And I call it manufactured rage because uh, it seemed like it was the only thing that 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 was that that would make you visible if you were angry, and that no one really cared about what you were like when you were not angry, or uh, I don't know simple things like uh, what happens to Dalit women at the workplace when they don't have to fight anyone anymore or when they don't have to defend themselves against attacks anymore. Um, I'm very in invested in questions of what does it mean to become an artist within this community? Because uh, 
it takes solitude and a certain kind of distance from the real world to become an artist. And when Dalit women don't have that, what happens to their passions? Or what happens to whatever it is that they want to nourish? Uh, so that got me thinking about how many of us are actively thinking about our own angers and the, in the way in which we are projecting them. Uh, and I also didn't, I wasn't very uh, happy about the fact that the angrier we were, the, the more visible we got, yes, but also that a lot of Savannah networks would sort of want to talk more in that they want to come and ask us more questions about why it is that we are angry. Um, and while it may in textbook theory seem very nice that someone wants to ask you why you're angry, uh, it sort of locks you in one state of anger and then there isn't much that's possible. Uh, uh, when Professor Sujata mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, I was thinking about how much uh, went into the struggle for the Dalit community and the Bahujan community to recognize themselves as people, as persons, and how much this anger holds us back, and how what happens on Twitter very often feeds into this anger so much that after a point, you even begin to enjoy being angry because you don't have to think after a while about why you're angry. Uh, somehow the image of the angry, angry Dalit woman is far more acceptable on Twitter uh, and on other various social media spaces than the image of a Dalit woman who actively seeks pleasure or a Dalit woman who's interested in food and does not want to talk about caste or does not want to engage with feminism. Um, I don't know many Dalit women who are doing this. That's also because I myself don't do this very often. I got stuck into the stuck in this anger whiplash for a long time. It took me a while to get out of this because I realized that if I'm angry, I don't have to think because people were there to lap up my anger, either out of guilt or out of uh, a certain kind of allyship. They wanted to swallow my anger, and I didn't really, I wasn't really comfortable anymore in manufacturing the same rage over and over again. Um, and I don't know, my, the question for me really was, if I take an interest in, let's say, Bollywood, would there be just as much of an interest in a Dalit woman's opinion on Bollywood? And not the regular Bollywood is cast as classist crap, but also, I don't know how many Dalit women do we know who really enjoy watching Bollywood films or love listening to Bollywood songs or just like talking about wine or something like that. Um, so what I hope to do with my paper was to uh, rethink my own journey on Twitter and to see whether it's possible for me to um, engage with a part of myself that 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 isn't actually very happy. Um, and not because I'm a very happy person in life, but because I also think that um, I don't have the vessel or the courage to represent the entirety of the Dalit community. Uh, I speak English, I grew up in a city, so I have to acknowledge these privileges. So I can't continue to be angry when I don't have it in me enough to sustain that anger. So these were just some questions that I was hoping to uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad that my paper raised more questions for me than it answered because this just means that I have a lot of thinking to do and I, I, I like thinking. Radha. Um, yes, I'm going to follow Professor Vijeta's, um, um you know, train of uh, con conversing with all my panelists as professor, because we acknowledge that we are all professors here. Um, so thank you. I also want to say that it's been a, such a pleasure working with all, all one, two, three, four of you here. Um, and I have uh, enjoyed most the building of relationships with you all. You're some of, 
as I mentioned this to Vijeta and Sujata more often than maybe to Sarah because of different hierarchies, um, one of the reasons I reach out to people under the guise of research online is because I need smart people around me. I need people who actually raise these questions. I have a very noisy brain. So here I want to say that this has been, this project has been about a rich relationship building with uh, the four people here. Um, it is not about uh, me as researcher or professor, but having said that, Having start, even though I started out with uh, my articulations as a poet and a writer um, of short stories, mostly for children, long, long ago, my voice only now comes out in, in academic writing. <laughs> yes, I know, <laughs> that's a strange thing, but I, I cannot come, I'll come bring myself out either in the voice of uh, my singing voice, which totally croaks anymore, or in the voice of creative poetry or anything else. Uh, if those voices come out, you'll find me bawling my heart out. So you don't want me to give those uh, voices out. So that's more for you on FX, my three. My three. And uh, one of the things uh, that we, Vijeta pointed out was what affects um, kind of, uh, distinguish our voice. And so part of my voice being coming out in these academic formats, and I think Moitri also made me understand this, is because I, uh, I start from speaking as an empath. I start through empathy. Um, so let me just leave that there. <laughs> because, um, and, and then talk about the actual paper and how the chapter writing came, began for me. Uh, the chapter writing began literally for me in, in December, 2018, when a Twitter handle called at Lean in India um, for the chapter of Lean in organization in India, um, kind of called out something called something for women of color, right? So the Twitter handle announced something like lead in women of color India. So I have to admit, I was, maybe it was very naive of me. I was very confused by the term of using women of color in India, because I was like, isn't everybody brown in India? Um, and this is me flattening everything. Um, and then the image posted was one of a darker skinned, seemingly sorry clad Indian woman wearing je jewelry identifiable as Indian. The slogan next to it, uh, uh, Moitri, just kind of say something if, if I'm talking too much. Uh, yeah, because it might not. Yes, the slogan next to it in bold stated, quote, don't let what you see on billboards determine your beauty standards. Hashtag dark is beautiful, close, and, um, close quotes. While the slogan definitely made sense in the context of India where colorism, and we have uh, people who are researching colorism, uh, even among upper caste and upper class populations is widely prevalent. The use of quote unquote women of India seemed misused. Huh? Okay, a few of us watching the Indian Twitter sphere saw it, saw it pop up on our feeds and we were a bit confused. Women of color in India, what does that mean? So the tweets questioning this characterization were posted by some, some Indian feminists, including Christina Thomas Dandraj, who is a consultant for At Dalit Women Fight, an advisor to At Smashboard and a founder of Dalit History Month. Um, at, at least that's what I got from talking to her for, uh, for, for different things. She was quick to question at Lean in India's use of women of color by tagging them in her tweet. While acknowledging, acknowledging that discrimination based on skin color is a serious in, issue in India, she also asked why the staff at Lean in India was lazily importing this term into the vocabulary of the Indian, or in an Indian context. 
Some of the discussion also pointed to the fact that in India, the bias against darker skin was rooted in casteism. Um, and uh, at this point, I want to say an aside and acknowledge the point uh, that both Sujata and Vijeta made about Ambedkar um, to also remind all of us that Ambedkar actually quit Nehru's um, um, government he uh, because of his strong opinions about women uh, and uh, how how the current Indian women's movement actually takes its history not from Ambedkar's uh, insistence on women's rights but from a different modern uh, track, which raises different issues. Uh, so, and we're seeing the fissures now with the, even the um, Hindutva appropriation of ideas of women empowerment, women's empowerment and uh, the erasure of um, caste and religion, but also the reimposition of Hindu uh, fem feminism, if that contradiction exists, as a feminism acceptable to the uh, current um, South Asian, even diasporic society, because the NRI community is very complicit in the production of this kind of uh, empowered lean and woman. Um, so, um, so several of us, then, you know, jumped in uh, to question this. We also, I think, got blocked <laughs> by the handle for a while. Um, that was when, again, of course, and I'm guilty of tapping uh, Vijeta <laughs> and Sujata often, and I'm also guilty of uh, dragging in my uh, graduate student uh, uh, GAs and uh, dissertation advisees into various conversations. Uh, I apologize for that, but not quite because uh, that is my mind space. <laughs> I, if I don't have people to talk these issues with, then I don't have anything to do in life. Sorry, <laughs> just kidding. But so anyway, um, so, um, so in that sense, this was the beginning of this article and uh, of this book chapter. Um, and it when it developed into a book chapter, some of this fell out because of word count issues. Uh, but I do appreciate that the editors of the book actually took that chapter in its spirit. So I'm gonna stop there, thanks. Perfect timing. Um, so uh, Radhika, um, was actually kind enough to allow me to explore some of my ideas in an essay, as well as co-edit essays by Sujata and Vijayta both um, for feminist media studies in 2020, which allowed me to gain a very different perspective and build a new problematic I've been working on since. Um, Sujata's essay in feminist media studies focused on Dalit girls' um, engagement with anti-caste politics on TikTok using uh, dance videos to Bollywood song lyrics. Vijayta's essay looked at the politics of emotions and the co-optation of Dalit women's rage by Savarna Indian feminists on platforms like Twitter. And both these uh, brilliant essays talk about the backlash, where, uh, whether in terms of moral panic to so-called vulgar bodies or trolling and online harassment. In both these essays, I also noted a um, genuine desire for a space online to be both free of expectations and perhaps be joyful. Um, which leads me to question, how do online platforms allow for affective structures of freedom, by which I mean an emotional architecture based on ethics of both freedom and care? There are now feminist writings that call to Black women to express um, affective excess, whether in the form of outrage, discontent, vulnerability or anger. But such disclosures of emotional excess also imposes a visibility upon, upon such women um, and Francesca, who's in the audience here, I can see um, Tammy as well. We've been thinking, we've been thinking on these terms, and so uh, such visibility must be accompanied with a politics of providing and receiving care. Moreover, a question must be raised in each of these contexts: Who does visibility in form of disclosures benefit, and who has the right to demand and enforce this visibility? In their current chapter, my co-speakers write that since 2012. Um, Dalit Bahujan, 
uh, trans, queer, and other marginalized populations in India have been very visible in social media and social networking sites as more and more activist individuals and groups from these social locations emerge. The emergent place-making capacities of these discourses rely quite heavily on certain individuals' willingness and sometimes even unwillingness, um, perhaps um, sometimes quite contradictory affects that uh, Vijayta was talking about, to engage in speech acts that challenge hegemonic discourses of power. Compounding the issue is the fact that uh, these digital speech acts can be screenshot, traced, shared, and otherwise have the potential to live forever. It's inadequate in my view to just discuss this visibility using the concept of labor, as in visibility labor or, in, or emotional labor. Although of course it is that as well. But it's also the platform's inherent individuating tendency that Ruha Benjamin talks about that gives these strategic affective pronunciations and performances that's intended to create and occupy a hashtag mediated space of solidarity, um, the shape of an identity. And not just any identity, but an identity shaped by pain and suffering. An identity that refuses to let these experiences go, perhaps in the hope that it will help others who need healing, the sense of responsibility that comes with that, the sense of risk. So in con conceptualizing the self and agency in this way, I'm of course drawing from uh, Lauren Berland's work on unseating sovereignty, um, Radhika smiling, she knew <laughs> that Berlant would come up, but also the limits of heroic agency in her article on slow death and obesity. Vijayda talks about um, her writing in an, in an um, interview that I read as an attempt to perform what she calls full body writing. There is a sensorial aspect to this formulation that is perhaps not fully conceptualized in scholarship around voice um, and representation. On the other hand, Vijayta's writing especially is also weaved in with Dalit feminist histories and cannot be neatly excised from this rich collective, collective lineage of writing, filmmaking, performances and surviving, which is also a creative act sometimes. Although she's an intentional subject when she's a writer, she channels within her writing and teaching and activism and social media presence, a commitment to the episodic nature of vague gestures, feelings, desire and work. In a re recent blog post, she, she writes, I love that they have work in their bodies. So beautiful. What does it mean to have work in a body, to be filled at times perhaps with work, to be grateful to have work to fill oneself with, to be animated by work? Moreover, in the context of intersectionality, does it make sense to be intersectional, to have intersectionality in one's interactions with others in a space? Here, Vijayta's works for me opens up a possibility to look at intentional being and becoming through an act of writing oneself into being in a way that does not reproduce me as an individuated subject of neoliberal economies of identities. Um, a possible way ahead for me, and actually it, it lies in a passage in the conclusion of this chapter we're talking about. Is it possible to be in both struggles, hashtag POC and hashtag anti caste, or in just one? Um, similarly, as Dalit and Bahujan feminists have noted, upper, upper caste slash upper caste, women of color and people of color also tend to uh, elide caste issues or even contribute to explicitly casteist projects. It might be that um, hashtag BIPOC and hashtag anti-caste coalitions connect more clearly as they represent populations in both the South Asian context and in the Euro-American context who are historically and institutionally marginalized. I'm quoting the chapter here. The focus here in this passage is on intersectional being, is in the sense of that this being is actually being formed within particular struggles. And to me, there is no other way to subvert uh, reproducing hegemonic power structures. As Berlin says in her article, practical sovereignty would be better understood not to take the mimetic or referred shape of state or individual sovereignty, but in a shape made um, through unconscious and explicit desires not to be inflated, uh, not to be an inflated ego deploying and manifesting power. I believe that subverting assumptions of heroic agency, manifesting both power and desire to shape the world in a certain way, is a way to think about intersectionality as transgressional alliances. Um, 
alliances that trans transgress boundaries of the self and interrupt self-making within a certain oppressive regime. Such alliances hold the potential to decenter white womanhood in the context of the global north, um, feminist discourse, as well as sovereign womanhood at the center of the nation building fantasy of mother India. Um, I started this event today saying that bodies and names hold privilege. I'm calling for a digital politics that not just calls out bodies and names that uh, hold and exert power, but also refuses to reproduce such bo bodyhood and namehood. What if the body, instead of signifier of power or powerlessness, is instead reimagined um, in Sioux surveillance terms, ones who watch and listen and are present, ones who show up, ones who sense and feel and touch, ones who are not one at all, um, cannot be counted in numbers of likes and shares, ones whose voices cannot be reduced to comments. Participation as well within this conceptualization may not be bracketed within the category of event. It's a position of humility filled conversations over long periods of time, interrupted by other things, other talks and other alliances. So to me, an intersectional web or digital space will refuse all the trappings of the cult of the individual within liberal governmentality and reimagine re power beyond the individual um, and collective dichotomy. Um, so thank you. And I will now just remind all um, audiences that you can um, start asking any, um, you know, sending comments or asking questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I will also ask or invite um, Sujatha to please um, give your comments or start off our discussion. You are the first speaker, so sorry, I'm going to you first. Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask, is there a specific uh, conversation or is there a specific discussion that Anything that, uh, so the way that I thought about it is we could kind of um, go around just because of, the, um, I suppose, the platform. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have a very organic discussion, but we would kind of just go around and you could just say if any comments from any of the speakers got your uh, attention and then we'll just go around in the same order and then we can all just chip in. Um, I think as I was listening to all of you speak, um, a theme that I saw emerge again and again, and uh, and a theme that interests me also um, is that of visibility. Um, and like I mentioned, I am um, working with other students from oppressed caste communities um, around um, admission procedures. And, and something that we work on as part of that is the diversity statement. Um, so to take your point, Maitre, about writing ourselves into being um, I think the question of how we write ourselves into being through a diversity statement is something that I've been grappling with. Um, and especially uh, what that process looks like for people from oppressed caste communities. Um, like Vijeta said, um, you know, on Twitter, um, anger is what gets people from oppressed caste communities and particularly Dalit women. Um, it is anger that gets them uh, visibility. What I find is that when it comes to a document like a diversity statement, um, it is pain and suffering that seems to be what is demanded of oppressed caste um, students. Um, as someone who was reading other students' statements, who as someone who's herself had to uh, write a statement like this, I found myself having a really visceral sort of reaction um, to the process. I found myself feeling really well, angry <laughs> about this demand that uh, students from oppressed caste communities lay our lives bare. Um, like you said, who uh, who is it that disclosure is being demanded from, and and what comes of that disclosure, right? Um, if I'm expected to write about my personal trage tragedies or about the sufferings of my family, um, what 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 happens to that process after that? Um, and and you mentioned care. Um, given that a document like this is being written in the service of getting oppressed caste students entry into universities, where they to face even more forms of violence, um, what, what happens to care then, right? Um, and so I think uh, I am interested in maybe, you know, speaking about this issue of visibility, because I also realize that especially in academia, visibility is currency. 
Um, so what do I lose? Uh, when I refuse to participate in these regimes of visibility? Um, and um, is there a way I can, I don't know, is, is, there, is there an alternative to visibility given that visibility is currency, um, networking is currency, um, can I opt out of it? Or do I ask for a re-articulation of, of the terms um, that enable me to make myself visible? Um, so I guess those are some thoughts that I have. That is so brilliantly put. Um, Sarah, would you like to come in? Yeah, uh, I was also thinking about this concept of visibility and going along with both that and what Vijeta was saying, this visibility of pleasure and the politics of pleasure online, who is allowed to exist in the online space just as themselves for things that they want to talk about, films or food or things like that versus who has to enter into this space and justify it. And as I said, almost educate others for it. And then how that's going to impact your own sense of self and things like that. But that concept of who's allowed to have pleasure here and also how that looks on those platforms. Twitter is not a platform that really allows for pleasure in any way, shape or form. And anger is going to go viral. Anger is going to get you that probably very important visibility versus a platform like TikTok where you can go viral with a dance video maybe that you overlaid with comments talking about uh, oppression or things like that. But again, that is a question of, are you allowed to enter into the space for yourself or are you being forced to enter it with others or for the sake of others, I should say. Brilliant. Um, Vijeta? Uh, yeah, I uh, now because I'm. Uh, I think I want to go back to uh, the point that I couldn't make uh, properly earlier, which is the point about uh, finding a way to be and using social media as a space where that being becomes possible. Uh, so a lot of what happened before I started writing and writing more openly was that um, I didn't know how to talk to people. I didn't know how to be at my workplace. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to talk to students. I didn't know how to teach. Uh, but it seemed as though that Twitter then became a space for me to share my writing. Um, and then it opened up a space where I could be someone who, who then I could imitate at my workplace. Um, so it's the other way around in that I, I, I was able to carry what I found on Twitter onto my, into my workplace, which meant that I was entering the workplace with my Twitter persona, which, which pretty much faked a certain kind of confidence that I wasn't solely capable of before, um, that I wasn't at all even thinking about before. Um, I'm interested in that, that what, what, what gets left on feed or, you know, outside of Twitter. Um, and that process happened quite smoothly because the more vocal I became on Twitter, the more afraid my son and my colleagues became of me. <laughs> I quite enjoyed that, but I also didn't want to, um, but I didn't want that to be the only thing that I'm known for. I'd much rather... I, I, I much rather have liked it if, you know, if they were scared of me because I was really good at writing or something like that. Uh, and not because uh, I have followers on Twitter or something like that. Uh, but that, see, my, my primary concern with, with, and this is not a complaint on, about Twitter or, 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 and also about the space that it makes it possible for that opinion, is that, uh, Everything, um, even the, it's a comfort that we are made to feel and also sometimes we want to feel in being, in remaining mediocre. In, uh, in not having to go the extra mile uh, in terms of achievement 
Um, so if I look back and think about what I've done in the last three years, I notice that I've, I've been angry or I've been upset or I've been given uh, chances or opportunities with, with editors or with panels or with, um, you know, with script writing or whatever. And, and then it hits me that I'm being sometimes and, and I'm being called to these places because I'm probably the only Dalit woman there or something. And that becomes my achievement. Not the fact that I might actually be good at something. My worry is that uh, there are days when I relish that kind of comfort where I'm okay with being mediocre. Uh, and I'm thinking I'm anyway getting the medals and the awards. So I don't really need to put in the hard work. It's a very dangerous thing because um, I'm not trying to say that um, Dalit women shouldn't be grateful for the little visibility that they have, but is it enough? I mean, what beyond the anger and what beyond the, the conversations or the intersection, where is, it, where is inter intersectionality going? Um, for me, the goal, the ultimate goal for any kind of intersectionality or conversation would be for Dalit women to realize their personhoods and, and, and if they want to become artists, that is to be that without relying on, on, on any of these simple cut-out ready-made models of being. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I just noticed the time. So what I'm going to do is Radhika, if that's okay with you, I'm going to hold back my comments uh, because I'm sure we'll talk again, um, the panelists, but I'll ask um, any of the attendees if they would like to ask any questions. Um, if you could just pop that into the Q&A box, I'll read that out. Um, There are no questions so far, so. I'll just give a moment. There's one comment there. Ah, from. Troy, uh, he's saying thank you for the panelists. Brilliant talks, manufactured rage. I like the concept, which reminded me of Ahmed's work on happiness. Um, you just asked, is it enough? Um, yes, so that I think that's for that's for Vijayta, um, who spoke about manufactured rage. Um, Teresa is saying thank you so much for sharing. There are many areas where there is commonality and I'm nodding and there are um, areas in this discussion which I would love to look at in more detail. I'll be reading your chapter. Yes, please do. It's absolutely brilliant. Radhika, do you have the, the uh, uh, chapter at hand to perhaps post in the chat box? Um, thank you, Afonso. Afonso is actually a second year student of mine. Thank you for attending, Afonso. Really insightful session. Thank you all for sharing. Asli is saying, thank you so much. Excited to read your chapter. So um, yeah, I think um, there'll be other readers of the chapter, which is what I wanted. It was a, it was a brilliant chapter. Um, okay, I'm going to actually go. Um, Sujatha, I was actually, I, I thought your, the way that you kind of were uh, discussing this piece of text, which is the diversity statement that's asked of, um, all of us, but then what does it mean for people from oppressed um, caste to kind of write um, themselves into being in such a statement and that knowledge of what is expected um, from them. But then you also raised the question of um, the ethic of care when you know that actually there, this person will actually face certain violences within the university, within academia. What um, my question is, what, what is the kind of ethic, of ethic of care, I would say, that um, not just the admissions department, but also universities, what kind of, do you have any kind of thinking around what sort of care would be required? 
Um, I think for an for an ethic of care to be integrated into universities, um, and particularly thinking about care in relation to the experiences of oppressed caste students, there is so much that needs to change. Um, I was thinking about this article that was published um, in an Indian um, publication recently on the experiences of Indian students who do PhDs. Um, and all of the issues they brought up in terms of the difficulties that they face with their advisors who continue to be mostly from dominant caste communities, but also all of the difficulties that they face um, in just the process of doing research. Um, so one of the um, interviewees in that article spoke about how distressing it is to come across um, uh, you know, essays and academic articles where um, uh, where people, where, where Adivasi communities or oppressed caste communities are described in really derogatory terms. Um, um, and, and how dehumanizing uh, be someone who has to engage with that sort of research. Um, so I think the simple answer is to um, say that we need, we need mentors who are not from oppressor caste communities to be part of these universities, but I don't think that's enough. I think what we need is a very fundamental shift in who gets to produce knowledge. Um, so, and, and I think this is something I mentioned in our last conversation. I think we need to go beyond asking who is present in the room um, because merely an increase in numbers is not going to fundamentally destabilize how knowledge is produced or what kinds of knowledge is produced. Um, and I think without, um, without shifting uh, the terms uh, in which, on which knowledge is produced or without, without actually bringing a change into our discursive frameworks, um, we cannot um, care for the oppressed caste students who enter our university. So I think the change needs to be at multiple levels, um, yeah. Thank you very much. And I definitely want to read about this. So I hope you will write <laughs> about this. This is actually really brilliant. Um, does anyone else want to want, want to say anything? If not, I just have a comment for Sarah as well. Um, I, I found your idea of um, how certain people have to justify their uh, being in a place. Um, to educate others, to be, you know, even with their presence, to be, um, you know, to, to kind of stretch people's awareness or education about certain issues and how that is related to kind of, um, to pleasure. I wonder if you could kind of talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I I can speak mostly to the communities that I am involved in or witness, which, as I said, tend to be fan communities. So you may have a fan or a person who's entering into the space because they love something. And in particular, when they want to point out a problem with something of like, hey, I love this thing, but maybe they could have worked on this. They then become a focus of attack from these other people. And then they are forced to justify, no, I'm saying this is a problem because maybe this is insulting, this is derogatory, or just this is perpetuating something that's going to be a problem in the long run. And they're only allowed to exist there if they justify both their love of something and their criticism of it. So even in that space where I said they want to enter into out of pleasure, every single thing they're saying becomes a force of scrutiny because they're perceived as not belonging there. Particularly when we talk about if they are not white, they are perceived as being an other who has to explain why they should be allowed to have this kind of pleasure. Great. There are some uh, questions now, which I'm going to read out. Troy has asked if um, you mind sharing the chapter in the book in the form of reference title. So if that can go on the chat. Um, otherwise, Troy, I can send that to you. Um, there is a question by, um, Tro uh, by Natalia who's saying, thank you so much for your reflections and discussion. Can you discuss more how intersectionality helps you theorize and make arguments about invisibility and affect, et cetera? Radhika, would you like to have a go at that? You're muted, Radhika. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just making a face at Natalia. Natalia is, by the way, one of my past advisees who's herself a full professor now. Um, I have to say that, sorry. Um, I don't know. 
I think there's a lot that Vijeta had said that connects to this. Um, and I think Sujata pointing to the diversity statement. Um, I think what's happening, frankly, is I think we need to be suspicious of uh, theorizing affect um, in the sense that not only has it become, that's why I laugh whenever my three boy brings up Vorland and um, uh, my iconoclasm goes in different directions, right? So I think it's become a, quite a bit of a buzzword in that we're constantly looking to locate affect. Um, but what actually, um, and what we need to watch out for is how actually these structures above us are actually commodifying this and using this to identify us in, in terms of our affect. And this is where I think all three, Sarah, Vijeta and Sujata, even Moitri have pointed to this visibility of affect in different spaces. So let's take, for instance, the diversity document that's uh, required for admission, which also connects with the personal statement that is required for admission. Um, the personal statement, going back to my time of trying to get admission to PhD programs, and now what I'm seeing from um, Savannah Kast uh, uh, Indians is is the uh, seems to invoke in us this uh, uh, exoticizing of the self through the upper caste Savarna location, um, where we start to invoke our quote unquote traditions and uh, mythologies, which themselves are super oppressive to locations such as Sujata and Vijeta. Um, and of course, um, that's not done thing anymore now. Um, and if you, uh, but, but, you know, it gets you access. Right. And um, the other thing is in terms of what Sujata is saying, um, we are finding that because of the past three years where we've seen, uh, let's say significantly, the, um, um, the, the ways in which Black Lives Matter has made these issues visible, um, again, in the global north, uh, the global north institutions are asking for DEI, diversity inclusion documents, when you apply for jobs. And I'm on the other side, sitting here looking at the diversity statements, which, which have been developing and have been very routine, but now, um, and I'll say this without compromising any confidentiality issues in the process that I'm engaged in as a committee member of a search committee, I see that the diversity um, inclusion um, um, department requires us to actually grade the diversity statements along certain spectrums, which is, do they show awareness and do they implement it? Do they, you know? And I was like, okay, that on the one hand gives somebody like me the power to kind of go in there and say, oh, this person is not actually showing that they can implement it, right? So uh, the, but, but, but there's layers and layers of knowledge, right? Unsaid knowledge that, that people don't have to grade these diversity documents unless they come from positions of lack of privilege. So the contradictions of all this, and I'm gonna stop there. Uh, Tori has a question. Um, I wondered if any of the presenters have, thought, have any thoughts on the recent calls to reclaim political blackness within South Asian communities. Um, personally, I will just ask the question that who would that serve? Um, I think especially, I think that is kind of completely um, going the other way uh, when you're looking to kind of reach an intersectional uh, perspective or analysis. So I think that given the fact that we know that, you know, upper caste um, Indian communities, especially, you know, have this, um, you know, ha have a kind of ongoing relationship with those in our <laughs> government and in, in those in power and absolutely have a vested interest in kind of reproducing these hegemonic um, categories and oppressions. 
which go unseen, right? And I, and I think that that's actually something that will be at this point, I think it will be quite harmful, especially when it is not uh, engaging in the kind of um, kind of critique of uh, these structures, especially when it's not kind of looking at how Muslim, you know, South Asian Muslims, for example, have been um, have been um, affected by the kind of recent changes in policies compared to, you know, how um, South Asian Bangladeshis have been kind of um, treated by immigration, etc. I think that reclaiming political blackness in order to perform allyship it sounds very dodgy to me. Sorry, if anyone has other comments, please. Um, we have gone seven minutes past, so there are a few more um, comments. I'm just going to read them out, but please, um, guys, um, please reach out if you want to continue this conversation with any of my brilliant colleagues. Um, and uh, they're on social media. They're also on, you know, the institutional emails. Um, and and I'm always uh, happy to put you in touch if you would like. Um, I'll just read out a comment. A truly brilliant talk by Burfin. Uh, truly brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Uh, Sujata, I think the privilege of theorizing also produces some sort of cultural particularism where theories stemming from experiences of oppressed groups are considered to be specific to those groups and not applicable to others. I thought that was actually a really good comment, so I had to read that out. But thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming. And uh, and thank you to, to my brilliant co-speakers. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to kind of, I think this is a starting point for us. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, Fada, thank you very much for joining. And good night, Vijayta. Thank you for joining at uh, late at night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.